Okay, welcome everyone, let's get started. Um, welcome to our viewers and thanks for tuning in this evening. My name is Sally Clifton-Parks and I'll be facilitating the webinar tonight. Our topic is a fish eye view of the Vaswanrat wetlands and this is the second presentation in our four-part four part webinar series. If this is your first webinar experience, please note that no one can see you or hear you. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that you have a chat button. So if you have any questions or comments throughout the webinar, please type them in here and our presenters will answer them at the end of the presentation. Please ensure that you select all attendees and panelists from the drop down arrow to send your questions to. When the webinar closes, there'll be a quick two minute survey that pops up and we'd really appreciate if you fill that in to give us your feedback. Um, if we're going over time, I'll jump into James's presentation and just give you the chance to leave the webinar if you do need to, and otherwise we'll continue on for a few more minutes. So without further ado, our speaker tonight is Dr. James Tweedley from Murdoch University. Um, James has been working on the Vaswanite wetlands since 2012 and has a wealth of knowledge. So welcome, James. I'll hand over to you now for the presentation. Fantastic, thanks, Sally. I'll just load my presentation. Okay, well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name's James. Some of you who are tuning in may have seen me in the flesh a few times at previous seminars. I've been working on the VAS since about 2011 now. We've done a wealth of fish research. And the goal for today is just give you a quick overview of what the VAS is like from the perspective of a fish, really. So the people watching this, you probably live around the VAS one up and you're not alone. Uh, seven of the biggest, most populated cities in the world are all built around estuaries. This estuary on the screen here, this is the Pearl River estuary in China. And if you hazard a guess in your head at how many people live on here, you may be a little bit surprised when I tell you it's 57 million. That's two and a half times the population of Australia live on the banks of a single estuary. So they really are meccas for humans. And if you think about it, early colonists would have wanted a fresh water source to drink, which would be provided by the rivers a source of food to eat, fish from the estuary, and the flooding that the rivers provided would have given good agriculture. You can then build cities around them and trade from them, build ports and industry, and you get the systems that you have today. And it's because of this that estuaries in temperate ecosystems are described as the most degraded of all habitats. So why they're useful for humans, they're really also useful for fish as well. So here we have a mangrove forest in an estuary and juvenile fish schooling underneath it. So there are many species of fish around the world that breed in the ocean and their juveniles move into the estuaries because estuaries are sheltered, nice protected areas with large amounts of food and generally apart from the odd recreational fisher, a low number of predators. They're a great place to grow up and then you can move back to the ocean but there are also some species that are adapted specifically to living in estuaries. So really the point here is that we love estuaries as humans, we utilize them, and so does the animals that live in there too, particularly fish. We'll move closer to home now. We can have a look at the vast one up and this marvelous photograph here. So you can catch estuaries on good days like this where they're, they're simply stunning ecosystems really productive um, and a great place to watch birds, to go fishing, to uh, be in touch with nature. But because they're at this nexus where we use them and nature uses them, there is some conflict. And that conflict can result, as in the case of the vast, in it being quite eutrophified. This here is an algal bloom in the dead water, essentially caused by a combination of nutrients and sunlight. Our estuaries are really susceptible to this just because of their inherent nature, that we live in one of the sunniest parts of the world, a warm part of the world, and that our estuaries aren't massively flushed so that any nutrients that go in there 
stay in there. But we're not here to talk about, you know, the good side and the bad side of estuaries. We're really here to think, what do the fish think? Fish aren't generally fussed about what we think. They live in these systems, they're evolved to, some of them spend their entire life cycles in here. And so we're just gonna go through a bit of a, a journey about what it's like to be a fish in the bass. So I think it's always kind of important to have a look in the past and see where we've come. So of course the vast one up is a Ramsar listed system. And because of that, they had this thing called the ecological character description done in 2007. There actually hadn't been a fish survey done at this time. And so they actually came up with a list of fish that are likely to occur in the system, but no one had ever looked. This is in 2007. Nothing much changed. And then we did a survey funded by the Southwest Catchment Councils in 2011, just to see what was in there. And we found some feral fish and um, goldfish and gambusia. And then we got some money to do a big survey of the near shore fish farm. And then there was a um, the fish kill event. And then we started looking at the deeper waters here. And because black broom were one of the species that were impacted by the kill, we looked a little bit about their biology. And then we've gone on to look at fish tracking. So how fish utilize the system um, using some tracking beacons that we implanted in fish. I'm not really gonna talk about that today. That's a bit of a separate topic. And most recently, we've been fortunate to be part of the integrated ecological monitoring. So what I'm gonna do in this presentation is kind of take you through these three things here, the near shore fish survey, the offshore fish survey, and the black broom biology, because this is really the most detailed data that we have and the more recent stuff from the ecological monitoring says it's pretty much as status quo. It hasn't really changed since this earlier stuff. So I'm just gonna focus on that because it's a little bit more detailed for you. I should say that um, I've got an awesome team of people who I work with at Murdoch who help us go out sampling. This is Brian and Kurt, and these are taken from their last ecological monitoring trip in March of this year. So coming from the UK, we tend to think of estuaries as the place where the river meets the sea, and therefore the estuary is always fresher than the ocean. So you have fresh water coming in, which is zero. You have the ocean at the other end, which has a salinity of 35, and everything in the middle is the estuary, and it's a bit of a melting pot. Salinities would be from say one to 34. We have really highly seasonal rainfall here, just part of our climate, and a very shallow system. So our estuary actually dries up here. And so it's really not a typical estuary. And I think it's one of only a handful in the world that are seasonally inverse, intermittently open estuaries. It's a really complicated mouthful. But if you think of the traditional estuary that I said, and you look at the vast in winter and spring, it's fresh where the river comes in and then it's salty by the ocean. That's your typical estuary. However, in summer and sometimes in autumn, as it was when we did this, the rivers dry up uh, and the top of the estuary dries up as well, which is pretty unique as shown in this bottom photo. And then you get these little pools of really, really concentrated seawater. And in here, they got to a salinity of 95, which is, you know, almost three times full strength seawater. Um, but we, I have recorded salinities over 130. So it really is quite an extreme fluctuating environment for fish to live in. But we have some really tough fish species here and they manage to do it. They're adapted to it because this is a natural part of our ecosystem. But it's something I don't think we appreciate enough that our, our systems are really unique and there aren't really analogous systems elsewhere. And if you do what I do and kind of walk along the banks of the estuary, you'll see there's a huge variety of habitats in there. If we start at the bottom down here, this is a photograph of the dead water, and you have kind of sandy beaches, riparian vegetation on the side, and there's the odd bit of um, wood, woody debris in there, which is good habitat for brim. And then as you go up, you cross the surge barriers, and you kind of get into oops, a broader expanse of water here, the sediment changes, it's a little bit more muddy and those benthic species of fish change as well. And then as you go further up, you can get these lovely rupia seagrass beds that you would have heard about in 
your last webinar. And then you can get this bit where it dries up, particularly in the upper vast and the upper water up. And then the water can actually come over the top as well and you get this really pretty kind of like crusty sediment of a thin layer of water on and it's really reflective. Going up further still, you've got the lower Bass River wetlands, which are up here and we serve it as part of that. And these environment pretty much stays fresh water all year round. I've never recorded it above a salinity of one. So hugely variable um, in terms of the environment that you get in terms of habitat and in terms of salinity. So what I'm going to do now is kind of walk you through um, some of the fish that live there. And we're starting with what we call the nearshore waters. Now, these are waters that are less than a meter and a half deep, essentially what you can wade in. And this is how we catch the fish. We actually go out there. This photo is from the dead water. We have a net that's 21 meters long. We walk out, we unfurl that net, and then we bring it back into the shore, which is what I'm doing here sort through the mud and any seagrass, woods and twigs that it brings up, and then we get our bag of fish. So this series of photos is all from our very first sign at site DW1 up here. It's the first sign I ever did in the bass. Now this method is really good because it targets the small bodied fish, which we'll talk about later on, and also the juveniles of some of those larger bodied fish like brim, like mullet, and like whiting. And it really gives a good indication of recruitment. This is how good the environment is for our juvenile fish. If the environment's good for our juvenile fish, we tend to get bigger fish a little bit later down the track. And you can see here, this is our sampling map. We sampled about 27 sites, I think it was, every three months for two years here. Come rain, come shine, we had 110K winds at one site, uh, sampled that. So this, this networks really well and gives us really good data on those small fish. So what fish did we catch, I hear you ask? These fish. So most of the ones we catch are hardy heads. So here's the western hardy head here and the elongate hardy head. There's another species that's a tropical species that we caught in the vast during this study and it's slowly moving down the coast with climate change, but I haven't put it in here. So these two in bold and the blue spot goby or the Swan River goby are the most abundant fish in the estuary. And the ones that are underlined are species that breed within the estuary. So all these ones up here, these two hardy heads and this goby all complete their entire life cycle in the bass. Things like the King George whiting, they come in as juveniles and we often catch really small King George whiting um, up in the top of the dead water. We've also got the juveniles of sea marlet, tar wine, and black brim. And we'll talk about black brim a little bit later. Um, but we do also get mosquito fish in here as well, which of course is an introduced um, species. So quite the diversity of fish. We've actually caught 32 different types of fish just in this one study alone. So let's have a look at where we're finding those fish. So this is a graph showing summer, autumn, winter, and spring, and the number of species we find per net. And you can see the most productive areas are the dead water and water up inland. The upper vast and upper water up, we didn't catch anything here or here because they were dry. If it was dry, you're not gonna get any fish, but you do get fish in winter. And my point here really is that the most number of species of fish are found in the areas below the surge barriers. This is because you're having marine fish and estuarine fish in there, and it declines as you go upstream. If we look at the density of fish, this is just a measure of the number of fish we get per net. Once again, it's the dead water and the inlet that are pretty much best in both seasons. Um, the wetland was super productive in one season because we got there just after spawning. And you'll notice that we have high numbers in summer, high numbers in spring, and low numbers in autumn and winter. So this reflects the spawning cycle of the fish. Most of the fish that live in here spawn in spring, so we catch large numbers in spring, large numbers in summer, and then during winter there are less of them because the older ones die. 
but also the water level in the estuary gets higher, it spreads out and fish spread out in that environment too. So there's more area for fish, therefore we catch less fish per net. So it's a combination of water level and breeding cycle of fish. Now this is another little graph here that shows you symbols that represent each of the areas. And the closer together they are, the more similar the fish are in that location. And what you can see is that the downstream areas, they group together here. So I'm calling them the marine areas, the dead water and one rock inlet, these ones. Then you've got the lower estuaries, the lower vast and the lower one rock. There's kind of just upstream with the surge barriers. And then you've got the upstream areas. And completely different to this is the wetland areas. So you've kind of got this upstream to downstream um, tracking of the fish fauna. So it's showing that salinity is a really big driver because salinity changes along this axis. And the surge barriers undoubtedly have a role as well. Fish do go through them, um, but they need to wanna go through them to go through them. This graph here shows for each of the regions, the types of fish that we caught. And the darker the shading, the more abundant that fish was. So you can see how we've spoken about the dead water and the inlet having more species of fish than the other areas. You can see that down here. The other thing to notice is that the fish down here are a dark blue. This means they breed in the ocean. So these areas that are downstream with the barriers, right next to where the bar is, they're getting these marine species and those marine species are not going further upstream. They're kind of hanging out in these areas. And then there's a suite of estuarine species, these ones in blue, that are kind of found throughout the system. So if we look at our pretty pictures up here, we can see we've got the yellow um, southern longfin goby, which has these beautiful white stripes and the male down the side. We've got juvenile mullets, we've got juvenile whiting, we get our trumpeter, yellowtail trumpeter, black brim, and this beautiful bridled goby, called so because it's got this horse bridle-like pattern just behind its head. These tend to be quite large for a goby, much larger than these ones. And we get our hardy heads, of course. When we go upstream into this area here, we're not getting any of these marine species down here. And really, we're in the world dominated by species that live in the estuary. Now, these lower estuaries can be quite fresh in winter. They can be, you know, one or two parts per thousand. Remember, the ocean's 35. And then in summer, they can get really salty. We're talking 50, 60 parts per thousand. But these fish are adapted to this environment, and so they can tolerate it. Moving further upstream still, we lose some of these species. Their density goes down a bit. And we pick up things like goldfish. So we often get goldfish in the top of the bass, not in the top of the water up because there's none in the rivers there. But of course, Bustleton has a famous goldfish population in the lower bass that we've been trying to get rid of for a while. And then in the wetland, it's those same suite of species again. And we get some of the gambusia, the mosquito fish too. So there's a real shift in fauna as you go upstream with different species adapted to living in different parts of the system. Now the VAS is a really interesting system because conditions in the middle bit here can get quite extreme for fish. We're talking about really high salinities. You know, most estuarine species of fish cannot live above a salinity of 35. This almost certainly goes above 35 and normally above 50 for most of summer. And of course we have had, we have had in the past fish kills you also got the drying, so fish lose habitat, and the hypersalinity that comes in, which would kill fish. And then when fish are in these little pools, being a Ramsar site with a huge number of birds, birds are going to come in as well and predate really heavily on these fish. I mean, it, pardon the pun, but it's like shooting fish in a barrel when the fish are in these little uh, little puddles here. The birds just come in and get them. So. I wouldn't be surprised in really bad years if there are very few fish in this part at all. Now, normally for an estuary, I'd be quite worried because you don't want to have a part of the estuary where there are no fish because the conditions are so extreme. But what we have is an area down here 
in the dead water where you get re-recruitment. So what you get here, the juvenile mullets that come in from the ocean, they grow up, they swim through the barriers and they repopulate this area with the hardy heads. And at the same time, you've got populations coming from the lower Bass River as well of different species, freshwater species that come in here and recolonize here. So each year you can have mortality of fish here, but re-recruitment from downstream and re-recruitment from upstream. And so it's really important that we manage these areas because they're our buffer against what happens here, which we have far less control over because we can't make it right. So that's the offshore waters. We'll have, to have the near shore. We'll have a look at the offshore now. Now these are deeper waters. They're sampled at night, hence my photo. And they're done using these walls of nets. So this is like a commercial fishing type gear, only we use smaller mesh than they do. So we can catch a really size range of fish down from anchovies up to things like mulloway and um, giant herring and things like that. This is all catch and release. So we catch the fish from the net, we put them on the measuring board, we measure them and then we release them and it's all done in the dark. So I spent many, many nights on the bass in my time. And this is what we've caught. So the most abundant fish are the mullets, the sea mullet and the yellow eye mullet, and black brim. So those three are by far the most abundant. But other fish that we commonly catch, the yellowtail grunter, the western striped grunter, um, we do get some yellowfin whiting, not many. And on occasion we get mulloway, and they tend to be the soapy size, kind of around about uh, 50 to 80 centimeters long. So not big ones, but they are there occasionally. And things like herring and salmon will come in as well, depending on how the runs go. So for those of you who like to fish black brim, this is a table of all the fish we've caught. So we've caught 32 species in the shallow waters, and we've caught 20 species in the deeper waters. And 17% of what we catch and released is black brim. So they are really quite abundant, with the other two species being the mullets. And you can see that when we fish the dead water and one up inlet, there's quite an array of species. And then when we get upstream, there's really not that much. So let's have a look at our little plot, looking at the regions. You can see there's a big divide on here with the areas downstream of the surge barriers, the dead water in the inlet being here and intermingled. So there's no real difference between the fish and one or the other. But upstream of the uh, surge barriers, we get very little. And when you think about it, there's not a huge amount of habitat in this basin. It's just a broad, flat basin. There's no real structure in there other than the fence or fences that kind of run through, particularly the water up. Whereas there's a little bit of habitat down the bottom. And also there's going to be those marine species of fish in the bottom. So this is that same kind of plot you've seen before. These are the regions on the top, dead water, inlet, bass, and then water up. And if you look here, you can see there's a huge number of fish that we catch here, lots of species. And they're all blue, mainly apart from black brim and the yellowtail, because they're all marine species of fish. They all spawn in the ocean, they come into the estuary and they feed in the estuary because there's lots of food, and then they go back out to sea, spawn. So down the bottom is a really diverse area. And then when you go upstream, we've only caught the two mullet species from the upper bass, and then we only caught the sea mullet from the um, upper water up. Now it should be noted that when we sample these, the water is really fresh, less than five parts per thousand. So these marine species are not gonna to want to go up there, even though they could, just because the salinity is too low. So it's not a surge barrier thing, it's more a salinity thing. They don't wanna go there because they're marine species that like the saltier water, which is down the bottom. So kind of what I've done is I've, I've shown you kind of what's going on in the vast from a fish perspective. But I think it's important to look at what's going on. So here's our map of WA, here's the VAS. And we've got some other systems around here that Murdoch has sampled for years. And what I'm gonna do is just see what's similar to what. So this is one of these plots again. And you see the VAS is here. So the VAS is actually most similar to Toby Inlet which makes a lot of sense really because Toby Inlet's what, 30 kilometers down the road. 
It's a similar system in that it's quite fresh for large parts of the year and that it's, it's closed off from the ocean for part of the year as well. And all these blue ones here, Swan, Peel, Lashnock, Blackwood, Oyster Harbour and Walpole Nornla, these are all estuaries that are open to the sea all year round. So lots of marine species can come in and that's what you're seeing on here. And that's why there's fewer species on the bass because the bar's not open all the time. Not a problem, that's just how they function. So yeah, the Vass is most similar to the Moore River, which is also a similar estuary to the Vass, and Toby's, which is located down the road. If we look at the offshore waters, it's kind of the same thing again. The Vass is most similar to that of Toby Inlet, which makes a sense with the biogeography as well, with some species not occurring, that occur on the south coast, not occurring on the west coast, and vice versa. So the closest system fish fauna wise to the bass will be Toby. So let's just spend the last little bit of the presentation talking about black brim, one of my favorite species of fish and of course a really important recreational um, target species for those people that I've seen fishing in the dead water and one or up inland. So you remember I did this survey in 2012 and we caught high numbers of brim in the five seasons here. And then we had the big fish kill event in April 2013. And after that, we caught very, very few brim. What we think happened here is the fish kill knocked out the bigger fish and the smaller fish. And so there was no recruitment. We're looking at a fish of around 30 to 50 centimeters, 50 millimeters long. So yeah, less than two inches, really. They disappeared and we were a little bit worried about them. And then they started to spawn again in um, the end of 2014. And now they've come back up. They haven't quite hit the heights of where they were before, but we don't know whether this was just a really good year and this is the norm or whether this is the norm and then they haven't quite recovered again. We just, we just don't know. We just need to keep sampling for forever to work that out. With the adults, their abundance, we only started sampling after the fish kill. I wish we'd done it before, but um, we didn't because we were focusing on goldfish at the time, not brim. And there's no real statistical change over time. Um, abundances have remained the same. So the fish population hasn't necessarily recovered from the fish kill. It's just, it's just remained stable, but we are getting recruitment. So it's not, not a disaster by any means. One of the things we do when we, when we get brim is we can take a small sample of them and work out how old they are. This is really important because lots of the stock assessments that help us calculate how many fish are in a system and how many can we remove through recreational and commercial fishing to keep the population viable, we use the growth rate. So we take the ear bones, we section them, and then we count rings. And what we can tell is using these rings in the vas, for a fish to be the minimum legal size at which a recreational fisher can retain it, 250 mils, that fish is 6.2 years old. So it has to survive over six years before it gets to the point at which um, we, can, we can catch it, which is about the same as the swan, a bit longer than the peel, certainly quicker than the moor, which is really horrendous, and the blackwood, and then Wolpan Onla. So there's some estuaries where the vast fish grow faster than and some where they grow, they grow slower. But it's kind, of, it's kind of about the norm with what we would expect. If you do go recreational fishing and you do want to eat your brim, you want your brim to be nice and fat. You want them to have a good fillet size. So we call this body condition, or the, uh, which is a bit similar to the body mass index you'll get done at your GP. It's a relationship between mass and, in this case, age, rather than mass and height in the BMI for humans. And from that, we can work out how fat they are with muscle proportional to their age. These are other estuaries. And this is the vast in 2013 when we did it. It was really good. The vast fish for their size and age were actually really fat. What we found in 2019 is that has decreased quite a bit. It's actually gone down by 12%. So 
So a fish is 12% lighter at the same length or the same age. And that's actually one of the lower values we've got for any of the estuaries. We haven't done this in this huge number of estuaries, but the vast is on the, the lower end of that. So we've got to think, well, why are our fish so light? What's going on? Well, I guess you kind of hear the phrase, you are what you eat. And if I wanted to put on lots of weight as a fish, I'd have a really highly protein rich diet. Perhaps not the 24 hour Maccas that's in Busso, but those high calorie foods are going to give you a good muscle conversion rate. Consequently, if I ate only vegetables, I'm going to get a lower calories from those foods and I've actually got to spend more energy digesting those foods. So they have less calories and I'm using more effort to digest those foods. So the question is, could the poor growth and body conditioning vast brim be due to their diet? So this is a little table here that shows you what fish in the bass eat as a frequency and a volume. So macroalgae is right at the top here. So in 95% of the fish we surveyed, macroalgae was in their diet. And on average, it was 82% of their diet. Detritus is kind of like um, broken up bits of seagrass, that seagrass rack you see on the beach, that's detritus. That was 3%. So 85% of their diet is essentially plant material. Only 6% is polychaetes, so they're worms, with small crustaceans, fish, and mollusks being really, really low. If we look at the swan, macroalgae is only 10% of their diet, and polychaetes, crustaceans, and mollusks, which are all far more protein-rich, are much, much larger. So really, it's a case of you are what you eat, and the fish in the vast are eating this, as opposed to a seafood smorgasbord. And that kind of explains why their fillet size statistic is a little bit lower. And they take comparatively longer to, to get to that 250 mil length than in other estuaries. So I'll just wrap up there. We'll take some questions, but it's really important to acknowledge the fact that I'm here speaking for many people who have helped us do research in the VAS really since 2011. So, um, yeah, a massive thanks to them. People like Angus who have sat there and rode through the VAS, dragging nets through mud. Uh, the VAS One Up Science Advisory Group have been amazing in getting the science done and all the people who have helped fund it because science isn't cheap, it's necessary. And without the support of these people, we wouldn't have done a third of what we've done. So thank you to them and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, James. That was awesome and um, yeah, very well suited to the webinar environment and easy to see and understand. So thank you for that. Um, while we wait for people to madly type in their questions, um, Sarah and I have got a couple here. Um, one thing I was interested in, um, you said there's the difference between the black brim in the vast wander up compared to other estuaries. Do you think that the brim might be genetically distinct from other brim in other estuaries, or is it more a, a fact of the variation in their environment and diet? Really, that, that's a really good question. So black brim are born in the estuary, they live in the estuary, and they die in the estuary. They, they, never, they never leave. So what's happened over the years is the brim in the different systems have become genetically distinct. So if we ever, for some reason, lost the brim in the vas, we're not going to be able to get them back because we can't translocate them because they have a different suite of genes. And okay. as well as being genetically distinct, their biology is what we call plastic. And it's plastic because it's flexible. Different fish respond differently to the environment. And so with the environment in the vas being different to other estuaries, because every estuary is different from every other estuary, mm -hmm. their biology is different as well. And that's reflected in things like growth rate, um, the timing of which they reproduce, and the age at which they reproduce. Um, yeah, so every, everyone's different really. And that's why brim are a good indicator species for what's going on in the system, because they do change so dramatically between systems. 
Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got another question about eels. Have you seen eels in the estuary? Someone's heard that they might be there. Do they mean anguillid eels or serpent eels? Oh, I'm not sure. I think it might be someone from our office and I think they thought they, they were small juvenile looking eels. So that's about all of the description I've got. Yeah, said they so don't know. Yeah. There are some types of eels like the Australian eel. If you've been to Sydney, they go into the botanical gardens from the harbour. They migrate up to fresh water and then they come back down to the ocean again. We don't get them on the, in the temperate southwestern Australia. So you get them on the east coast, not on the west coast. You do get them up north. Um, so it's probably not them. But I was watching a video that we'd recorded in Wachinacup estuary down in Albany. And we actually called a moray on film wow. in the estuary. And so there is a species of moray, the green moray, that does go down the south coast. So with the rocky habitats out in Geograph Bay, you could have had one of those wander into the estuary. And we do catch serpent eels from time to time. So yeah, it could be real. Yeah, interesting. Um, I've just seen that they've added a comment here saying that it was seen by one of the local Wanarup residents. So something to keep um, our eyes out for when we're on the wetlands. Um, the next question is related to how fertiliser overflow affects the different environments. So um, obviously we are all working quite hard to reduce nutrients um, flowing into the wetlands. Do you have any thoughts about how that might specifically affect the fish in the wetlands, James? It's, um, it's a real case specific thing. So if we um, go to say Broke Inlet, which is where I did my PhD in Walpole, mm. you would struggle to catch fish. One of the reasons we struggle to catch fish there is the entire or 97% of the catchment is national park. It has a very low level of nutrients. And so those, there aren't many nutrients in the estuary for the fish. There's very little seagrass and things like that. And actually if you go to Wilson Inlet, yeah, just 60 Ks down the road, same size, but has more nutrients going into it, that system is far more productive. There's far more food there for fish. There are much larger numbers of fish. But there comes a tipping point when you go too far and that's when you get the big algal blooms and the fish kills. Mm. So it's kind of a, a combination with a little bit of nutrients that are okay. And actually you may get a more productive environment with a few nutrients coming in. But if you go too far, that's when you get the, the negative effect. Great, thank and you for that. Um, a widely regarded as what we call sinks for nutrients. Yeah. So you get nutrients that wash in from the ocean, you get nutrients that wash in from the rivers, and that's a natural process. We've just increased it a little bit with fertiliser. Okay, great. Thank you, James. Um, you mentioned that um, fish will go through the surge barriers if they have to. Can you elaborate a bit about how those barriers stop the fish coming and going from the, from the estuary? Yeah, so obviously the, the, um, the barriers themselves have the one-way flaps that open when there's flow on the upstream side that's going through. So fish can zip through there, but they tend to be going against the current when that happens. So they need to kind of want to go through. And then, of course, you've got the fish gate in the barriers as well. So we've actually got a, a pit tagging system on the VAS surge barrier right now. And pit tags are those things that you put in your pets that you scan when you go to the vet or if you've got a missing pet, they scan it and work out who the owner is. We put those in black brim and we can see when black brim move through the barrier. And in fact, it sends us a text message every time they do. And using those data, we can work out the times of day that fish move through and the hydrological conditions at the time with which they go through. And what we find for brim is they don't like flow. So at the times of day, when the tide goes in and out, that the, air, the water height on one side is greater than the other. What they tend to wait until the two sides are about level, in which case there's very little flow through the fishway, and then they go through. So yes, you can, you can open the hole in the barrier, but fish will go through when they want to go through. Great, yeah. And it's that science that we're using, we're working with the Department of Water to make sure that gate is opened at the best time to allow mm. fish to go through. Great, thanks, James. 
Um, we've got another question just building on the nutrient question. Do you think um, the influx of birds adds or subtracts from the nutrient load? I guess they're adding poo, aren't they, but taking out fish. So, yeah, any thoughts great, on that one? Great question. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a tricky one. I would say that birds would be reducing nutrients because the poo they produce may not necessarily go back to where the fish were. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're consuming those fish. They would also be using nutrients from the fish that they consume. Yeah. And birds are warm blooded. They have a fantastic metabolism. They burn loads of calories. So they're probably, they would probably put back less than they use. And then those Birds that fly into the ocean as well may poop over the ocean and you get nutrients in there. So I would say birds would be lowering the nutrients. Great. I like that. I like that hypothesis. Um, now, I'm just doing a quick time check. Anyone who does need to leave can jump off now. Um, please do fill in the quick survey um, that you'll see pop up when you do leave. Um, but we do have time for a couple more questions if anyone wants to type one in now. I've got one here that's asking um, if the black brim life expectancy is impacted by their diet? Um, probably not, no. So fish, are, unlike humans, we, we eat food all the time because we're warm blooded, we need huge amounts of food. And we reach what we call an asymptotic size. So we grow as children and then we reach the size we are as an adult and then we don't grow anymore. In fact, some of us shrink over time. And, and, but actually fish grow throughout their life. So if you've got a, a lower nutrient diet, your growth will be slower, It'll take longer for you to get there. But as far as I know, that doesn't impact life. What it may mean is that you breed at an older age because you haven't reached the point with which you're sexually mature yet. So it can have a negative impact on breeding because you, you take longer to get to sexual maturity, but it won't necessarily impact your life expectancy. And for black brim, the oldest we've caught in the estuary, I think is 15 or 16 years old. Right. Um, James, we're often asked about commercial fishers in the, um, in the Bass Wanderer. Is there any um, current commercial licenses and is there any impact on fish numbers because of those? So the, the licenses for commercial fishes are handled by the department. Um, in one of the Black Brim reports, I, the fishers were kind enough to let us use their data and they catch very few numbers of Black Brim. Mm. And this is because they're fishing upstream of generally where most of the Black Brim are. So the, the, fish, the commercial fishes are targeting mullets mm. of which there are, there's a plentiful supply of mullet. And if you want to increase the mullet, you just open the bar, the juveniles will come in and they want to go upstream. It's in their nature. They want to hit those low salinity waters. Um, and so I think the way that commercial and recreational fishing is spatially separated in the bass is quite unique. Most of the wreck fishing is done in the dead water over the bridges and around the surge barriers. But all the commercial fishing is done upstream where recreational professional fishes don't really go because there's no real access. And actually there's no fish up there that you'd want to catch as a wreck fisher. Okay. Mullet online is not a very good fun fish to catch. And all they're going to do is nibble the bread off the end. So I think the vast is one of these situations where yes, there's commercial fishing going on. Really don't think it has any impact on the brim populations at all. Great. So they're yeah, different targets for um, commercial and wreck fishes. Yeah, so um, they're targeting different species, but they're also fishing in different areas as well. Yeah. And where the wreck species are is not where the commercial fish is fish. Works out well. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here that is besides fish and us, I guess humans, what else predates in the waters? Birds would be a big one for the Ramsar side. So we've done some work on the osprey and the um, sea eagle diets that are going on. And they certainly, the ospreys in particular, are big, big feeders on, on mullet and broom. And um, you may have noticed a slight decline in the graph on adult brim. And I actually put that down to the resident dolphin that we had for a little bit. 
Um, again, birds and dolphins, warm-blooded, need huge amounts of calories per day in order to maintain their metabolism. Mm -hmm. And so they're voracious predators. And so, yeah, w when, when you get the occasional dolphin, you can see them going up and down, herding fish into the shallows and eating them. That could so, really wreak havoc with your numbers. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. We certainly, we certainly saw a reduction in fish when the dolphin was there. Now, some of that will be because the dolphin would scare away fish from our nets. Mm. But also, the area, the dead water, and one up inlet is not very big, mm. and so big apex predators like dolphins could play quite a significant role in a short space of time because their energy demands are so high. Mm. But you know, we don't see dolphins too much, so enjoy them. Don't don't worry that they're eating all your fish. Yeah. Um, James, a question here from Sarah. Are goldfish and mosquito fish the only non-native fish in the system or are there other feral species? Those are the only ones that we found when we did the survey. Um, the integrated ecological monitoring didn't go into the rivers like our survey earlier did in 2011 to 2013. Um, they're the main ones. We do get um, introduced crayfish as well in the lower bass river so yeah there there are there are crayfish species we get we get the odd um yabby in in the river as well um goldfish has been a bit better we did the tracking on goldfish and found that they use the new river wetlands as a breeding area and so we did some targeted eradication using our tracking data to work out where the goldfish were and then use some electrofishing to get rid of them so we've caught far less goldfish than we did in the past so that, that's a good sign yeah that's great um, we've got a question here about the distribution of sea mullet. So um, the person has said that they remember sea mullet being right up to the Bustleton Bridge and beyond the, um, the milk factory. Mm. Um, also, the, their neighbours showed them a photo that has a net um, with most of the meshes holding mullet caught near Bustleton. So their question is, can we look beyond uh, the narrow band of time that our, that that your taxonomic impression provides to envisage how the system was and perhaps how it could be again. So, um, yeah. yeah, is your sampling broad enough to, to know or do we know how different things might have been in the past? For the vast, we do. So when there was the fish kill in, I think the, the late 1990s, um, Jim Lane and others did a, did a survey and one of the surveys was talking to people with what we call local ecological knowledge. So there's people who remember what the system was like 40, 50, 60 years ago. And there's a document called the Recollections of the Vast Fishes or something. And it included some, um, some people who are well known in the community today, their ancestors, if you will, like their, their parents and grandparents. And I remember reading it and you, you, you see these stories about mullet going right the way upstream and what the system was like I think lots of mile away rings a bell for one of the one of the interviewees. So that's a really interesting document to read. I've read I've read it a few times. If you can get a copy for your website, that would be uh, would be really good because um, our data only shows what we catch at that time, and we're not there all the time. So given so that the floodgates have been in since. Is it 1908 or 1920s? The floodgates were initially installed. I wonder. Um, I wonder what the difference is over that that period. Yeah, so I think the gates were installed in, in the yeah pre 1910, and they were replaced in the 1920s, and then again in the 2000s. Yeah. And um, so yeah, the, the gates have been in there for for a long, long time. Um, fish don't take too long to adapt to them. So yeah, mm -hmm. as long as mullet can go through them, then they'll, they'll, they'll go right upstream. So I know when we've done the goldfish eradication program right up past where the water hyacinths used to be in the bass, right up past Australia Street, I think, we, we've caught mullet up there. Mm -hmm. um, they want to go into, into fresh water. So they'll migrate right the way through there. Great, thanks, James. Um, a question about the fish gates. Do you think the fish gate is big enough? I've seen water going upstream at low tide. I guess that's because evaporation is greater than the inflow at high tide. Your thoughts about the fish, fish gate size, James? 
that's that's one where we don't really have the information to to assess it scientifically and um, so normally what we would do is we'd put fish on a treadmill so to speak and then look at their swimming performance under different flow rates so the bigger the hole the the more water that will come through and that would affect obviously all the water quality monitoring and if you had a bigger hole you'd be able to open the gates for less time because more water would transfer through but i would imagine the velocity of that water the speed of that water would be less mm -hmm. and so fish that are that are more shy would be more likely to go through but um we've never really looked at the swimming performance of of many of our um our estuarine species of fish we've done it for our freshwater fish because there are fish ways Kent Street Weir on the canning is a good example of, of that. Um, and so, yeah, we put fish in a tank, we've cranked up the water flow and see how fast they can swim against the onrushing water. So without doing that, um, it's really kind of hard to say. But it does have the trade-off that if you make the hole bigger, you'd likely be able to open it less because more water will be coming. Right. So um, and it's complicated. <laughs> it always is with Vast One Rock, isn't it? <laughs> Um, the estuaries in general, because they're such a melting pot of what happens on land, what happens in the ocean, and the estuary bears the brunt of both. Um, just on the previous question about the mullet swimming right up to the butter factory, um, Sarah's found that document you were talking about from Jim Lane, so we can um, we can email that one out um, to the person, yeah, person yeah, asking that question. It's a really interesting read. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Okay, just looking if anyone's got any last minute questions to um, type them in now, but um, I was curious to know what further research you think is needed for fish in the vast one run, if there's gaps or if we need longer term data, James? Um, look, the, the data that, I've, that I explained today is really kind of high resolution data at a, at a diverse range of sites. That was all done when we had a different water management regime going on. The water management regime and operation of the surge barriers has improved now that we've got more, more knowledge, thanks to revitalizing geographic waterways. So um, we can always do more research. I think we just need to target it to particular questions and, and management scenarios now. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of work in the VAS um, in the last 10 years, more so than probably any other estuary outside of the metro area. Mm. So Swan and Peel obviously get a, get a lot of focus and we've got indices of health in those. So perhaps maybe using fish as an indicator of restaurant health in the VAS would be a good one. We do report cards for DBCA in the Swan. We're gonna be doing it for the Peel Harvey Catchment Council in the Peel. So yeah, perhaps a sort of annual report card for the VAS would be good. But yeah. the conversation will be who's going to pay for it. I'll do it. <laughs> uh, who's going to pay? Yeah, happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. um, one final one that we've got here says the system has and continues to be highly modified. So, do you think future development in the region might have an impact? Good, good question. So, in in Europe, it's illegal to have a polluted estuary quite how you define polluted because it goes to a court of law is really um, subjective but they have this thing called the water framework directive and so they monitor each estuary every year and if it's polluted they have to do things about it the problem is if you're going to do that in an estuary like the thames or the seine that runs through paris you've got a system that you can't remove the city of paris you can't remove london so they've adjusted their benchmarks accordingly. You're not going to take them back to pre-European colonization for the bass. You know, the surge barriers play an important role. We can't get there. We can't, you know, we can't remove them, go back to what it was like 200 years ago. So mm. we've just got to set realistic benchmarks and find some indicators that work. Um, certainly we want to, I would advocate that any future development does look at how it impacts the estuary. And because the estuary is impacted by what happens on the land and the ocean, sometimes there are links that are, aren't quite intuitive. You know, it's not an obvious link, but doing something has a knock-on effect to the estuary. 
But, um, Thanks, James. Um, they're sneaking in here. Um, someone's asked, does the aerators at the gates help fish health? Now, I'm assuming this might have been related to the oxygenation trial um, a few years ago now. I know it certainly um, it, it did a reasonable job at improving dissolved oxygen, but I'm not sure that we were monitoring any, any impact on fish, James? It's, yeah, it's quite hard to... It's very easy to monitor oxygen because you can put a probe in and set it to record and then just leave it. What happens to fish is much harder. Um, certainly, if fish cannot escape an area of low oxygen, they will die. Some fish, like the Swan River goby or Blue Spot goby, can actually breathe from the surface of the water. But that's, that's the only one in the bass that can do that. So um, raising dissolved oxygen levels, particularly at night, in that bass exit channel, that they go down at night quite substantially at certain times of year, particularly when it's warm or the, stra the stratification, so a difference in temperature or salinity between the top and the bottom. Um, so I would say that any improvement of oxygen is going to have a positive impact on fish. Mm. But I, we, we certainly didn't, didn't measure it, but more oxygen is a good thing. Um, I recall that um, the, the monitoring of the oxygen showed that they could keep it above critical levels for a lot of the time, but not all of the time. Um, and Doug, that report is on the Revitalising Geograph Waterways website um, about the oxygenation yeah. trial. So you can, I mean, one you of can the find that there. Yeah. If you think about the swan, the oxygen plants in the swan are at Cavisham and Guildford. They're no further down because we don't have the technology to aerate wide areas. So it'd be very hard to aerate the vast or one or up beyond the bit where they're quite narrow. Mm -hmm. So the vast exit channel, it's still not easy to aerate, but it can be done. The other areas are much harder. But what we do have is a consistent sea breeze. So that breeze will be adding water, uh, adding oxygen into the water and improving that environment as well. It's when you get those still days in summer that oxygen, oxygen goes down because the wind is doing stuff for free. Great, thanks James. Um, I haven't seen any other questions pop up, so I think we're at about time now. Um, it was awesome to have you on, James, and that was a really interesting presentation, and I'm sure everyone will agree. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining. The um, survey should pop up when you um, end the webinar. Oh, we got one last minute one. <laughs> we, might, we might answer that one um, out of session if we, if we need to reply um, by email for that one. So um, yes, please, everyone, do fill in the survey. If you're after more information, you can go to the Revitalising Geograph Waterways website or Geocatch website. Um, and there's a couple more webinars coming up in the series, one about water quality and gate management, and the final one about water birds on the Bass Warner Up. So um, keep your eyes out for those. Um, so thank you, James. Thank you, everyone. Okay, no worries. Thanks for your time and thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Bye.